Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending wherever you are in our little globe. Uh, this is exactly noon, 12 o'clock here in Ankara, in my hometown. This is also the capital of my country, Turkey. And my name is Umut Akyol. I am an otorhinolaryngologist. I am a, a ear, new nose, and throat surgeon. And we'll be talking about mucopolysaccharidosis today. And more than an ENT surgeon, I'm a pediatric ENT surgeon. So I'm dealing with kids. I see little children all the time. And uh, this is my best ever business card that I ever had. And this was done by a five-year-old young lady, a patient of mine. Most of the kids, as you can imagine, begin crying when they see me. But some of them bring me beautiful pictures like this. So as, again, as I told you, we'll be talking about mucopolysaccharidosis. But before beginning, I want to make one thing very clear, crystal clear. I am an surgeon. I am an otorhinolaryngologist. I really do not know anything about uh, metabolic disorders, pediatrics, and I'm not the one I shouldn't be, I couldn't be, I cannot be talk about metabolic disorders or MPS or differential diagnosis. I am a poor ENT surgeon, but I know that we are very special and we are very important in terms of MPS patients. And uh, we're going to see that's an uh, important part of our being in this team. And I hope I'm going to share some information with you during the next half an hour, 40 minutes. And before beginning, I should be showing uh, two slides, a disclaimer, as you see here. And uh, of course, my disclosures. I'm not a member or I don't have any relations with any pharmaceutical industry or any company. I'm working in a university hospital as a professor and also has my own private clinic. But from time to time, I am invited to uh, scientific and educational meetings just like this one with honorarium. And I should be thanking Takeda for giving us this opportunity to be together talking about this very important subject today, uh, as we will see and from the next beginning from the next slide. Before again beginning, this is our agenda, uh, I would like to ask you to submit, send any questions anytime during the talk. And I will be very pleased if you can send me, you know, ask me questions. If I can answer, I will be very happy because we will have enough time in the end of the talk in order to answer the questions, hopefully. So, and again, before beginning, uh, let's test this a little bit. Uh, people most of the time tell me, wrongly of course, that I'm speaking too loud and you know too fast. If I am with my broken English, I'm not a native speaker as you uh, probably uh, see, uh, let me know if I'm too loud or if I'm too fast, just send me a you know, mail or text so that I can slow down. Anyhow, uh, we're going to be talking about MPS for the next 30 to 40 minutes and uh, beginning with an introduction and then about diagnosis, I, I don't know anything about differential diagnosis. I cannot differentiate mucopolysaccharidosis or properly diagnose it, but I can help to diagnose little kids and as early as possible, which is very important here. And hopefully we'll have an interactive discussion by means of a couple of questions that you will be able to vote and we can go on depending on the results of the voting. And then we'll be talking about the potential consequences of delayed diagnosis, the importance of early diagnosis. And uh, before the end, another very important subject is the challenging challenges and dangers of, you know, especially surgical treatment of MPS patients, which is very important for me as a surgeon and for you and all my colleagues, because they are dangerous, very dangerous patients in terms of surgery, pre-op, post-operative period, very serious complications with high rates of mortality and morbidity, weights us while you know, dealing with these kids. I'm going to talk a little bit about these, you know, dangerous uh, in, the, in the end of the uh, talk. Then let's go and begin with the introduction again. I'm not the one who will be talking about MPS. I cannot, I'm a surgeon. But I know that it's a very rare disease, and as you know, in, the name implies, it's a very rare disease. Rare diseases are uh, having prevalence of one to 2,000 and one to 200,000, depending on where you live. In Europe or United States, it's different. But we know that it is very rare. We don't see these patients very frequently. 
But the important thing is there are many of them, more than 6,000 rare diseases. Almost 80% of them are genetic, which is very important. And more than 50% of them involves children. That's why I see a lot of children, and I, from time to time I see rare diseases. And unfortunately, 30% of these uh, children die before the age of five with rare diseases in general. Uh, the important thing about rare diseases is there's a broad diversity of disorders and symptoms. They are chronic, they are progressive, degenerative, and unfortunately, frequently life-threatening. And another important thing is common symptoms can hide underlying rare diseases, leading to misdiagnosis, late diagnosis, and delaying treatment like in MPS, which we are going to see now. Mycopolysaccharidosis, specifically type 2 Hunter syndrome, which we will be focusing today on, but in general, mycopolysaccharidosis is a genetic disease. It's a lysosomal storage disease, one of the lysosomal storage diseases. And the uh, important thing is it's X-linked recessive disorder. That's why we exclusively see male patients. And Again, in <coughs> all mycopolysaccharidosis, there is something wrong in an uh, enzyme that degrades the mycopolysaccharides. By the way, we are not using the term mycopolysaccharides anymore. We are using glycosaminoglycans, GAGs. They are, MPS is out, GAGs are in now. So uh, there is something wrong with the GAG me metabolism. And since the GAGs cannot be metabolized, they accumulate in the body, all over the tissues of the body, and causing some serious problems. And that's why MPS can progress toward significant loss of mobility and functional independence and shortened life expectancy. MPS is challenging to diagnose, but it's, it's very important. First of all, it's a rare disease, as I told you. The incidence is told to be one over 160,000 live birds. That's why it's very rare. MPS in general is, of course, we can see more the other types. And uh, another important thing is, as we said, it is progressive. The symptoms are not usually evident at birth, but can emerge in the first years of life. We will see that. It is multisystemic. This is important, manifesting in a wide range of symptoms, which we will be discussing later. It is very heterogeneous in initial symptom presentation, age of onset, and uh, rate of progression. The phenotype varies patient to patient. Can, even in a family, it is uh, not the same. So all patients, all cases are different. This is another important point to keep in mind. Uh, the broad phenotype spectrum ranges from a non-neuropathic type to a neuropathic form, of course, the neuropathic form is, you know, worse, as we will be seeing, involving central nerve system. All these factors contribute to MPS2 or MPS in general being challenging to diagnose, which is why differential diagnosis and diagnosing these kids, especially early diagnosis, is very important. So I'm not the one who can talk about differential diagnosis. I don't know how to properly diagnose MPS or differentiate different types of MPS, but Diagnosis, we can help, especially as an ENT surgeon. The otorhinolaryngologists are quite special in this, you know, in this point, as I told you. We'll see. We, I said that it's a multisystemic disease, so it involves central nerve system. When central nerve system is involved, it's called a neuropathic type. When it's not, it's called non-neuropathic type. And as you can imagine, neuropathic type is worse. The ear, nose, and throat, head and neck area, respiratory system, airway is the most you know, of the time involved. And more important, early in their lifespan, when they are little babies, it is involved. Skeletal system, later in life, it's getting involved. Peripheral nerve system, facial features begin to change about one and one and a half years of age and very important. Dental, skin lesions, cardiopulmonary, gastrointestinal, all systems are involved. But as a specialist, especially as an ENT surgeon myself, we only focus on one our own narrow part of the patient. In my situation, it's ear, nose, and throat. But in order to see the larger picture in a jigsaw like, just like this, we should be also take a look at the other systems, the whole body and the whole patient, and have some knowledge about the disease. Hopefully, 
I'm going to give you a couple of take home messages for you that is very important that will be helping us to see this whole patient in the end of this you know, talk. I would like to go on with hypothetical undiagnosed MPS patients. A little baby, little kid got MPS, we don't know. But this is most of the time how it goes in his or her lifespan. Let's say that our little baby, about one years of age, has a hernia, which is very common in MPS, an umbilical hernia or a genial hernia. And of course, when a kid or a baby got hernia, we send them or him or her to a pediatric surgeon. It's quite obvious the diagnosis is a common childhood disease, hernia. So what he or she is going to do, the surgeon, will be either to follow up the kid or do surgery, repairing the hernia. So our little kid, little baby, has hernia, maybe had undergone hernia surgery when she's very, very young, but also has some serious ear, nose, and throat problems common ear infections, otitis media, recurrent otitis media, effusion in the ear causing some hearing loss. That may, of course, cause some developmental delays too. And these are the kids with you know, enlarged adenoids and tonsils that is obstructing the airway, causing snoring, apnea, sometimes obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So these are the kids whom we, the ENT surgeons, see very early in their lifespan with very frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections, ear, nose, and throat infections, and also obstructing the pharynx because of the enlarged tissue, causing some sleep disturbances. Frequent visits to ENT specialist. And these kids may also have some gastrointestinal problems, GI problems, namely chronic diarrhea, and they have enlarged liver and spleen. The MPS causes enlarged liver and spleen, and that shows itself as a bloated abdomen. So we have a little kid, had already undergone uh, hernia surgery or had hernia, have still hernia, frequent attacks of ear, nose, and throat infections, otitis media, obstructing the upper respiratory tract infections, visiting ear, nose, and throat very frequently and also gastroenterology because of the diarrhea or the big abdomen. Now, I'm going to ask you my first question, and I want you to vote, please. There are four options, as you can see here. This kid having attacks of upper respiratory infection, hernia, and GI problems. Whom would you refer to? These are the options, so I would like you to vote now. Are you going to continue under ENT specialist management? or send the kid to an immunologist, or to an allergist, or suspect of MPS, uh, sending kid to medical geneticist, what would you do? And uh, of course, as an ENT surgeon, uh, I can go on uh, with you know, giving, prescribing him antibiotics, steroids for otitis media, or take him into the operating room, or I can send to an immunologist suspecting an immunological problem or an allergist. Allergy may cause frequent attacks of you know, upper respiratory tract infections, otitis, or a medical geneticist. So while waiting for the answers, and I see that most of you have already chosen medical geneticist. That would be the ideal scenario, but unfortunately, in real life, it is not. I'm talking about the ENT surgeons. I can talk about you know, ENT because I am an ENT. Most of my colleagues who are not naturally aware of MPS or really do not know much about other than ear, nose, and throat. After all, we are surgeons. We know what we do best, and we don't know the rest of the medicine or science, and we don't think that it's important at all. Anyhow, <clears throat> but <clears throat> if we're not aware of MPS, we would be sending this kid either to an immunologist or an allergist, the ENTs. The data shows us that most of these kids are sent to allergy immunology with a suspect of you know, an immunodeficiency disorder or an allergy. And an allergist, an immunologist, if he or she sees this patient, of course the diagnosis will be an immunodeficiency disorder, so he or she will be ordering some more investigations, or an allergy, prescribing him some anti-allergy, antihistaminic drugs. So our little kid with ENT problems have seen ENT, pediatric surgeon, gastroenterologist, now an immunologist, allergist, are having still problems and getting older. 
unfortunately, if he or she gets older, the diseases shows its manifest, but it's getting a little bit too late because the changes are now here to stay. They are irreversible because of the morphological changes took already place. Anyhow, the little kid, if he or she hasn't been you know, diagnosed yet by a specialist, as most of you suggested, uh, now has some skeletal problems, mainly joint stiffness and claw hands, which is very important. So if you follow this kid or if you see this kid having frequent attacks of respiratory tract infections, pediatric surgeon has seen him, allergy and immunology is following her or him, who would you refer this kid with joint stiffness and claw hand next? To an orthopedic surgeon, surgeon or a rheumatologist or a physical therapist or now a medical genesis suspicious of about MPS. Let's see the results now. And uh, as an ENT surgeon, I can again tell you that not knowing much about mucopolysaccharidosis or rare diseases or their systemic other manifestations than ear, nose, and throat, most of my colleagues will be, you know, sending him or her into a orthopedic surgeon, as you also voted here. Uh, health and health will be sending to an orthopedic surgeon, and the rest will be sending him to an MPS specialist or a metabolic disorder specialist. Anyhow, this kid was sent to an orthopedic surgeon, or, you know, I mean, having joint stiffness and claw hands, the diagnosis can be juvenile idiopathic arthritis because of the stiff joints, or carpal tunnel syndrome, which is very, very, very rare in a tiny little kid, and that needs surgery. And of course, if there's a carpal tunnel syndrome, there's obstruction there, the orthopedic surgeon should you know, release this. I think in this point of time, all my colleagues from the surgical side, to, including the orthopedic surgeons, will be suspicious of something else. And as the kids is different, changing, all systems are involved. And this kid will be sent to a metabolic disorder specialist. Because of these you know, common and different uh, symptoms from different systems, of course, the management, I mean, the, the diagnosis will be, you know, taken care by the pediatric metabolic disorder specialist in my country or a general metabolic disorder in, in, in your practice, in your country. I don't know who is going to take care of that. <clears throat> but now we can, I mean, diagnose these kids. But as you can see, I mean, before the diagnosis, our patient has already seen four, five, six specialists and many visits to hospital or out care, I mean, the, uh, the outpatient uh, departments. And uh, after the diagnosis, which is a little bit late, we really cannot help as much as we can if he or she has been diagnosed earlier. And most of the time, this is the story in all rare diseases and MPS patients. Before the diagnosis, they see many different specialists. They go to hospitals many different times with different diagnoses from specific systems and treatments. This is the story and this is the fact The <clears throat> as we told that uh, we cannot really recognize, catch these kids when they were born because they were normal. But the symptom onset is about one and one and a half years of age, as you, we can see here. And the median mean diagnosis time is about three and a half years. So if we can catch these kids as early as possible, before the median diagnosing time, three and a half years, when they are one and a half years, two years, three and a half years, it will be really very beneficial because early diagnosis help them to live a healthier, longer life with a much better quality of life for themselves and for their families and of course, as well as the society. So we can help them. We may not talk about you know, the treatment, but we can control the disease. That's why early diagnosis is very, very important in this progressive disease, which will progress in time into a point where some morphological irreversible changes take place. That's why early diagnosis is very important. We have to avoid delayed diagnosis. So what can an ear, nose, and throat specialist, what can a surgeon do? 
these kids, all of them, as you can see here, have ear, nose, throat, head and neck problems. And most of them happens very early in their lifespan. The pathophysiology is quite obvious. The GAGs are accumulating all over the body. When the GAGs accumulate in the or around the eustachian tube area or the ear, it causes some ear infections. Frequent attacks of otitis media, fluid in the ear, otitis media with effusion, causing some hearing loss. And these are the kids who come to us every second week with you know, draining ears, whom we have to prescribe antibiotics when they are one year age, or one year old, one and a half year old, two year old. So they have frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections. They have large adenoids and tonsils obstructing the pharynx, causing sleep disturbances. They are the snorers. They have apnea. They have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And they are very young. We have to take them into the operating room, either for putting tubes or taking the adenoids and tonsils out to help them. Not only, of course, in the pharyngeal area, but the GAGs accumulate all over the airway, including the lower parts and causing some serious, serious problems with very dangerous situations, as we will see. This is my own, you know, department series. We are following almost 60 MPS now, and as you can see, more than half of these patients had undergone adenoidectomy, tonsillectomy, and or tube placement surgery, ear, nose, and throat surgery. More than half of them have hearing loss. Almost one third of them have voice disorders, balance problems, and of course, almost all of them have rough edematous airway, as we will be seeing in a flexible endoscopy examination soon. The important thing here is, again, we, the ENT specialists, see these kids very early in their lifespan, when they are one, one and a half years of age, because of otitis media, because of nasal obstructions and different facial features. So if we know a couple of points regarding MPS, and if we can you know, remember a couple of important things that we will be talking again now, we can catch these teeth as early as possible, which will be, again, very beneficial for themselves, for us, for the family, for the society. And <clears throat> as an ERT surgeon, what am I going to do in a little kid with having some frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections? I will check the ears. So they are the ones who have you know, acute otitis media, fluid in the middle ear, otitis media with effusion. They have recurrent otis otitis media. More than you know, three-fourths of them have otitis problems. And of course, not only otitis. I told you that because of the, the uh, jaws and the enlarged tonsils and adenoids and the tongue, uh, which is obstructing the oropharynx, they have obstruction. And uh, not only in the upper part, maybe you can follow the trachea here, horribly narrowed and deviated. They have serious airway problems too. What I do in these kids and what we all should do is, of course, flexible endoscopy, which is a very simple and easy thing for us to do. We do it all the time. I do it all in, in all my patients. And as you can see here, uh, in the endoscopy, there is that swollen, whitish, edematose, adenoid tissue here. And can you see that the the, even the larynx, the vocal forts, they are kind of edematous and they are swollen because of the GAG accumulation. And you can imagine, this kid has a voice of a 40-year-old, you know, very hard, uh, smoking rock singer because of the, uh, the, the edema and the GAG accumulation in the vocal folds. Most of them have some voice problems very early in their lifespan. And flexible endoscopy really helps us a lot in order to diagnose and follow them. That's why we are using flexible endoscopy most of the time. Okay, as an ENT surgeon, I have to check the ear, nose, and throat. But as we have seen, I should be aware of other systems too. I should be, if I can, taking, take a look at the medical records or ask whether they had other surgeries or other problems uh, other than ear, nose, and throat or other than my own specialty, if I'm a you know, pediatrician, if I'm a GP, whatever I am, I should be also asking other systems to. This is the way to catch the 
disease as early as possible because as we have seen, these kids have not only ear, nose, and throat problems, but also have gastrointestinal problems, diarrhea, enlarged liver and spleen, hernia. Facial features are very important, but unfortunately, they are beginning to change after the year of one and one and a half. With broad nose, prominent brow, large jaws and thick lips, a big protruding tongue that is obstructing the oropharynx, and a large head with a prominent you know, for, for, uh, front of the head. And uh, some of the families told me, even in very early babyhood, these kids were a little bit different than their you know, fathers, mothers, or siblings, brothers, sisters, with a slightly larger head. So these facial features can be you know, uh, distinguishable if you know what you're looking for. Facial features and dental features are present there. Skin can be very important if they have pebble skin, it can be patognomonic. And then skeletal problems, they occur unfortunately later in their lifespan. And uh, that's why we have to check the other systems. But the most important practical point here for us, the ear, nose, and throat specialists and all the specialists who see these patients in their outpatients all the time, because we see a lot of kids, keep in mind that kids with ear, nose, and throat problems, frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infection, otitis media, obstruction, had already undergone an ear, nose, and throat surgery, plus having hernia or a history of hernia surgery, that is a very important togetherness that should you know, light up the light bulb in our brain saying that, okay, this kid may have mucopolysaccharidosis. If we only know this, if we're aware of this fact, we can catch people. We did. I did after learning this, of course, and I'll tell you how to. The diagnosis, early diagnosis is very important, as I told you, because as the disease progresses, especially in my, my area, the airway surgery, these kids become very, very dangerous in terms of surgery, preoperative, operative, and postoperative period. They have very high rate of morbidity and mortality and all the complications. They are the kids whom you don't want to see in the operating room in post-op period with serious problems. That's why it is also very important, and that's, that's a very unfortunate case, how I learned that, how we in our department learned that. Uh, we had a patient. Uh, she was a 10-year-old female MPS patient. Unfortunately, very advanced disease with serious craniofacial and vertebral anomalies horrible kyphosis with vertebral bodies obstructing everywhere. You cannot really put him into her in spine position. He, she had critical, critical obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And uh, she was taken into the operating room for an adenotonsillectomy once, but an anesthesiologist, a senior uh, colleague of us at that time, she refused to put her into sleep, and she was sent back to the ward. But the kid get worse and worse. This disease was very progressed, and uh, some wrong decisions followed each other. Uh, chief resident of us at that time took her into surgery again, and uh, they had to open a tracheotomy, did the tracheotomy, took the tonsils and adenoids out, but as expected with a horrible pulmonary situation, all the complications occurred, followed each other, and unfortunately, we lost our kid uh, second postoperative day in the ICU. And that made me and us think a lot about it. Because there's quite a dilemma here. We know that they are the kids who need surgery because they have frequent attacks of otitis media. They cannot hear because of the fluid in their ear. We have to help them. We have to put them tubes. We have to take the TNA surgeons. They have the indication there. They are the kids whom we have to operate. We want to operate. They need the operation. But on the other hand, we know that they are very, very dangerous kids in terms of operation. And we know that there is a high rate of mortality, morbidity, all the complications. That's why we don't want to operate them. We don't want to take them into the operating room. This is the dilemma here. And what I told, what my cases you know, made me think is, if we have a kid with mucopolysaccharidosis having problems, try to operate him or her 
as early as possible in their lifespan, in their disease span, before the disease progresses and the morphological changes, practical changes are there irreversibly that you cannot help. Then the operation will be worse and it will be more dangerous and it will be more difficult. That's why now, if I can, I try to operate these kids as early as possible. And of course, what is very important for any of us is we should be aware of and ready for all the risks and complications. And that's why we should be working in a multidisciplinary system environment. A multidisciplinary approach is very important. We should decide all together with my metabolic disease uh, specialist, pediatricians, especially I need a very experienced and knowledgeable anesthesiologist in the operating room as well as an ICU uh, specialist because we should be sending these kids to ICU after the operation in order to be prepared for all the complications. And of course the family should be a part of this multidisciplinary approach and we should be telling them the, uh, the, the dangers of it and what we should be doing, we should decide all together. So this is a multidisciplinary approach. And if you are taking care of these kids in the operating room, as we do, you should be very well aware of these facts. If you do not have this setting, send him or her to a tertiary center and do not you know, uh, take the risk. And <clears throat> after saying that and knowing that they are dangerous, I would like to ask you another question. This is an MPS patient now. It's a five-year-old boy. Uh, a mild patient, doesn't have really much you know, drastical changes in, their, in his, uh, his uh, systems, ear, nose, and throat especially, but he's got a mild hearing loss for the past three, four months, let's say, and sleep disturbance, but minimal. He doesn't have serious apnea or obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. The otoscopy shows us that there is fluid in the middle ear causing some hearing loss, and that's obvious that we should be putting you know, tubes in order to get rid of them, or keep on going giving antibiotics or whatever we're giving and she, he's got a large tongue, tongue and tonsils and adenoids roughly obstructing the half of the airway and the uh, audiometry and the tympanometry shows that he's got a hearing loss conductive type that we can take care of by you know treatment okay this is the question what would you do are you going to wait and see I mean take care of and call him every three months, two months, six months, whatever, do the audiology. Are you willing to, you know, going on with the medical treatment, with more antibiotics, maybe some steroids, topical or systemic? Are you going to put some ventilation tubes or send him for ventilation tube placement? Or are you going to send him for ventilation tube placement plus adenotonsillectomy? Also take the adenates and tonsils out or, you know, uh, do something about opening the airway. Okay, this is the uh, this is the uh, kid with an MPS known, diagnosed already, having mild problems about you know, hearing and also obstruction. What would you do? Okay, what I would do? Again, half and half. Almost fifty percent of us will be. Wait and see. I don't want to take care of this kid. This is a dangerous kid. Very understandable. That's okay. And more than half of us now choose the D. I will go and put ventilation tube insertion and donate to me. I'm not sure whether there is a you know, strict right answer here, but again, I told you my own idea and my, uh, my, uh, my uh, cases, uh, what my cases taught me. Uh, I don't think that wait and see is a good option here because this kid has problem, and I know that the disease is progressive, and it will be getting worse. He cannot hear, we should do something about that. I mean, we should, of course, we can prescribe him some hearing devices, but which is not you know, the thing to do in a little kid, if we can do something else, which is putting tubes. So wait and see, I wouldn't do it. But I can understand, I mean, if you want to, or you can send him to another you know, specialist or a big tertiary center. Medical treatment, more antibiotics, steroids, topical steroids, systemic steroids. You can try, but probably I have already did that for months now, and he had been using antibiotics and other drugs for many times, but this is not, you know, uh, helpful in our case, and uh, most of the time it is not. We know that. So the choice is surgery. 
Ventilation tube insertion is a choice. It's a good choice because ventilation tube insertion is a minor surgery. You can do it even under anesthesia without you know, intubation, a full anesthesia. The anesthesiologist can put her or him into sleep with a mask or with a laryngeal mask, and you can put the tubes in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and it is not as dangerous as a full, you know, big operation. And uh, it can be done anytime. And we need to, to put some ventilation tube in this kid. I, I agree with that because this will be taking care of the hearing loss for at least a year or two. What I would do, but probably will go on and do the ventilation tube insertion as well as the adenotonsillectomy. Because I know that this kid is not very dangerous at the moment. I know the diagnosis. If I have a dependable, knowledgeable, good anesthesiologist, ICU unit, I'll be talking with them and probably it will be a straightforward surgery and I will take the tonsils and adenoids out or you know, shave them in order to open the airway because I know that the disease is progressive and in two, three, four, five years time, it can be more dangerous to do so. So in my opinion, the right answer is the ventilation tube placement plus adenotonsillectomy. That's what I would do and what I would advise you to do. Again, let's you know, try to stress the take home messages that I would like you to take home. And this is, first of all, if you have a little kid, baby, with frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections, otitis media, large tonsils adenoids, needing surgery, or had already undergone surgery for adenotonsillectomy, putting tubes, plus hernia, especially hernia, or a history of hernia repairing surgery, this is a very valuable togetherness. Please keep in your mind that this can be an MPS patient. Of course, there can be other systemic manifestations like orthopedic ones, GI ones, but they are following later in their lifespan. But in a kid two years old, a year and a half years old, if you know this togetherness, you can catch an MPS patient very early you can help him or her to be diagnosed very early in his or her lifespan, and that, that is very valuable. And this is the first take-home messages, and the second take-home messages is, again, we have, this is the same slide, these kids are dangerous in terms of surgery, not only in ear, nose, and surgery, ear, nose, and throat surgery, but they also have to undergo some different surgeries for orthopedics, for example, or cardiovascular, or whatever. And, but they, are, they can be very dangerous, so be prepared for all kinds of complications, high rates of morbidity, mortality. You have to be working in a multidisciplinary team with all the specialists involved, of course, including and probably led by the, the metabolic disorder specialist, as well as, of course, the most important ones are anesthesiology, I, intensive care unit specialist, pediatricians, pediatric pulmonology, pediatric uh, infectious disease, whatever. We should be all together deciding what to do and take care of all the complications, be ready for A, B, C, what we should be doing after the, or during the operation. And if you have a setting like this, go on and do whatever you want to do in this patient. If you do not have, I think it's a better idea to send this kid to a tertiary center with experience you know, taking care of MPS patients. These are the two main messages that I would like to give today and I hope it will be hopeful in your future practice and I hope just like I did and we did in our own department we can catch these little babies kids as early as possible earlier than the median age and uh, help them to be diagnosed uh, in order to you know taken care beginning earlier for a as I told you healthier longer life with a more better quality of life. And uh, that was the main messages. This uh, is the end of my talk. We have enough time now, and I'm going to take a look at the uh, uh, questions now. And hopefully, if I can, we'll try to answer the questions. But I have to wear my eyeglasses now and have, a, have to take a look at the small pad here. Okay, there are some questions here. How nice to see. 
I will be reading the question first and then try to answer. What do you mean by recurrent otitis media or recurrent respiratory tra in trap infections? How many episodes could elicit suspicion of an underlying cause? Okay. Recurrent otitis media for us is more than four episodes of otitis media in a season. And as you know, if you are taking care of kids, most kids have this. I mean, if they begin to kindergarten or daycare early when they are two, three years of age, most of them have recurrent otitis, uh, otitis media or frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections. If you have a kid going to kindergarten three, four years of age, the mean you know, attack of upper respiratory tract infection in Ankara, in my hometown, is about 10 to 15. So it is not, you know, it is not something very uncommon. We know that most of the kids going into kindergarten or their care early in their lifespan have recurrent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections and otitis media. This is not specific to MPS patients. But as I told you, these are the kids who come to us more than you know, the usual, very frequently, draining years, antibiotics all the time, have to go and then put tubes and still cannot control the disease. I mean, this is important, plus, of course, hernia or other systemic you know, uh, manifestations of MPS. That's why I'm telling that it's frequent attacks. How would you characterize the degree of hearing loss? Is the hearing loss in MPS2 noticeable in normal conversation? Okay, this is a very important question. I'm an ENT surgeon. Hearing loss in these kids are mild. Let's say 20 to 30 dB decibels of hearing loss, which is in a logarithmic scale, you know. Uh, 20 to 30 dB doesn't mean that 20 to 30 percent. A kid having fluid in his or her ear, having 20 to 30 decibels of hearing loss, in a you know, kindergarten or classroom setting, may or most of the time misses three out of 10 words of his or her teacher speaking. This is very important for a little kid, you know, missing three of 10 words and you know, trying to make up something. And this is a problem. If it goes on, you know, if it becomes chronic, for a couple of days after an otitis media, it's quite normal. But if it goes on more than two to three months bilaterally or six months unilaterally, we have to do something about that and put tubes on. That's why hearing loss in little kids is very important, whether they have MPS or not. But in the MPS patients, it's more important. Most of the MPS patients have some conductive hearing loss because of the fluid in the ear, just like the other kids. But in time, they also have sensorineural hearing loss too, depending on the disease. Can you see glycosaminoglycan induced swelling of cells if you carry out histopathology examination of the adenate or tonsil sample? Do you recommend a histopathological examination? I don't know. I'm not a histological person. I'm, I'm an ENT surgeon. I do not know anything about the histology or the you know, molecular basis of the disease. But we had a study sending all these, of course, specimens to pathology. And uh, with some specific stains, you can, yes. But I'm, I'm not the one who can answer these questions. In order to get answered these questions, as you will be seeing, we have uh, very good resources. You can reach the specialist, the metabolic disorder specialist uh, from one of these resources, or you can reach me. But I'm an ENT surgeon. I'm not the one who can talk about the histopathology or the molecular basis of this disease. MPS2 is a genetic disease, and if there was a family history with any of these symptoms, I would suspect MPS2. Isn't family history key to MPS2 diagnosis? Again, I'm not the one who can answer this, but of course, yes, in a genetic disease, of course, the, the, the pedigree is very important. And uh, of course, like most of the genetic disease, especially in an extinct disease, where most of the, almost all of the time, uh, male patients are involved, uh, you should be taking, I mean, you should be asking questions regarding the family history and pedigree. But as an ENT surgeon, I really do not know much about this. I don't have enough time to do this. I don't do it regularly. I don't ask their family history or, of course, I ask if there is a history in the family or if the kid has another kind of systemic disease, all the patients, all of my patients. But I don't know really much about genetics. But I, if I get suspicious, I can send this to a specialist. I'm not the one who to answer it. But the, the main answer is, of course, yes, this is a genetic disease. Family history is very important. You should be asking this. Another question. 
I think that the facial features of MPS2 are quite distinct symptoms. If I saw any of these symptoms with MPS2 facial features, I would refer to a medical geneticist. Why aren't facial features the driver of diagnosis in all cases? Okay, the very good point. Yes, but I told you, the facial features are very prominent. If you see a couple of MPS patients, which we have seen the pictures of some, they are very much look like alike. And, and, and if you can see that forehead, the uh, nays, and the obstructing tongue, tongue with the jaws and the uh, uh, pharynx excluded, it is quite obvious. But unfortunately, they are not there to see when they are very young. And after the age of one and a half, two years, they are becoming prominent. But again, this is a very good question. Yes, you can. I mean, if you have seen a couple of them, then you can catch them as early as possible. In fact, in, our, in my own department, one of my audiologist colleagues, she's not a doctor, she's an audiologist, caught an MPS patient. I mean, he saw one little kid and said that, okay, this was a little bit looked like the other patient that I took a couple of days ago, he or she had MPS, and uh, she sent the kid to uh, the pediatrics department to be at metabolic disorder, and turned out to be that this kid had MPS. So it is right, you're absolutely right. If you are aware of what to look for, you can catch, but not very early. This is the problem about the facial features. Another question, do dysostosis multiplex and joint stiffness affect all bones in the body? As an ENT specialist, can you detect changes in the bones and joints in the head? Of course not. I told you, I'm an ENT surgeon. I, like all the surgeons, I think that I know the best, I know my area very well, and I think that what I don't know doesn't worth knowing. This is, you know, being a surgeon with a huge Zeppelin-like ego. Of course, I'm exaggerating, not all my colleagues are like me, but uh, no, I'm not the one to answer this, and uh, an orthopedic surgeon would be the, you know, the right one to ask the question, probably, or the metabolic disorder uh, disease specialist. That's why, if I am suspicious of anything, I am sending these kids to my colleagues from different departments, involved departments. I have the chance, because I'm you know, working in a big hospital, university hospital, with all the other branches, subspecialties of pediatrics. I am lucky, but anybody can do that. If you are suspicious of anything, you can send to a specialist and ask for. The main thing here is knowing that these kids may have other systemic symptoms too, and sending them to right person. And the right person most of the time is metabolic disorder specialist. Another question. Do you think you can tell that there is some type of storage disorder present by a generalized swollen appearance of soft tissues in an MPS2 patient, as documented by nasopharyngoscopy or otoscopy? Tough question. Most of the kids just the one like I showed you. It was a little baby, a year and a half year old, that uh, nasopharyngoscopy, flexible endoscopy patient. You notice that there were some swollen you know, tissues, mucosa and submucosa, and there was edematous you know, background there with a big adenoid hypertrophy. Most of these kids also have you know, ad adenoid hypertrophy. If you are really, you know, experienced and you know what you're looking for and you are looking for MPS, you may, but for a regular ear, nose, and throat surgeon or a pediatric ear, nose, and throat surgeon who really doesn't see much MPS patients, I don't think that the, the, the right answer will be yes. No, no, you may not, you cannot. Another question. In the case study you shared of a 10-year-old that died of postoperative pulmonary complications, is there an argument for performing adenosynectomy earlier in the disease course, before disease progression increases the risk of airway complications during anesthesia? Yes, that's how we learned that. That's how I learned that. And uh, if I would be, you know, having a chance to see such a kid, I wouldn't wait for these drastic changes irreversible changes to happen that will increase the risk of complication and morbidity and mortality too much. And that's why, you know, I want to share my opinion with you. If you have to operate these kids now or in the future, they will not be getting better. They will be getting more dangerous. 
That's why I try to operate them as soon as possible. That's why I put them some larger ventilation tubes that I know will be staying there longer time because they will be needing them. And that's how I do. And uh, uh, this yeah, unfortunate case uh, taught me that. Let's see if we have any more questions. No, not here. Then it is time uh, to say goodbye to you. Thank you very much for listening to me. Again, you can reach one of these websites for more information. You can reach me if you want to whenever, if you need some you know, specific advice for ear, nose, and throat. But I hope you have taken the take-home messages that I gave you today. The most important two is diagnose these early kids as early as possible. Just keep in your mind that frequent attacks of upper respiratory tract infections plus hernia is very important in order to do so. Second, they are dangerous patients. Be in a multidisciplinary team and ready for all complications. And thank you very much again. And I wish you all a heavy, very happy, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. It is over. Thanks. <laughs>